I think I'll go ahead and kick it off. So thank you all for, for joining today. Um, super excited for this, for this virtual event. Um, my name is Grace Scribbin. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for Beacon Wind and Empire Wind. And today we're super excited to be hosting this virtual event along with our incredible partners at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Association Coastal Ocean Observa Obser Observing System, also known as Maracuse, and RPS, uh, Tetra Tech Company. So as most of you know, and the reason why we're here today, um, is because Equinor and BP recently, in conjunction with NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, have publicly released maritime data from the Empire and Beacon Offshore Wind Lease Area buoys. So this data is being made publicly available as part of the Maracus Oceans Map, which is a framework developed jointly by RPS and Maracus. And it's, it's very exciting. It includes the results of two years of collected data coupled with future near real-time data. Um, and it includes detailed information on wave heights, currents, wind speeds, wind direction information collected by these buoys south of Long Beach and east of Montauk, New York. So today we're excited to learn more about this informative and valuable data set through today's presentations from our partners. And, um, you know, the release of this data set and sharing of it going forward really complements Equinor's initiatives to prioritize transparency and knowledge sharing as we develop our Empire and Beacon Wind projects. So super excited to be sharing this with you all today. Before we get into the presentations, I just want to quickly go through the agenda and some housekeeping. So... So just a brief agenda, uh, I will be presenting just a quick overview on Equinor as a company, as well as the Empire and Beacon Offshore Wind projects. And then we'll hear from our partners at Miracus and RPS more about the, um, the data access, followed by a Q&A around 12.45, and then we'll have our closing remarks. So thank you all for joining today. Just a quick note on the Q&A. You should all see the Q&A function here on Zoom. So please use that to ask your questions um, at the end of the session. And if your question's not answered today, we'll be sure to follow up with you after the event. And just note that this presentation is being recorded and will be um, expected on our uh, website at some point in the future. So just to be aware of that. But now I'm going to go ahead and get into Equinor as a company and give you all just an overview um, of our global presence. So Equinor is actually a broad energy company, um, an international company based in Norway. So we've been around for about 50 years and been in the U.S. since the uh, 80s, the late 80s. So we are a U.S. ally and champion of creating a low carbon future. We have a presence in 30 countries and 22,000 employees, and we have projects across the globe. Um, and about a decade of experience and expertise in offshore wind development. In this next slide here, you'll see exactly where we are in the world. So uh, this map offers a good view of the scale of our commitment in the US, as well as our global aspirations. You can see from the legend that the locations in lighter blue are our offshore wind projects currently producing, the darker blue are in construction, and the lighter peach are the ones in design development uh, pipeline, which includes our East Coast portfolio, which I'll get um, into detail in a minute. But um, just to note, Equinor partners with other leading companies in the energy transition across the globe. And as you can see on the map, we have projects spanning from the Baltic Sea to the U.S. West Coast uh, with plans to, in the future, to build offshore wind in Asia and Brazil. And so off Equinor has really distinguished itself as an offshore wind industry leader um, in many of these projects that you see on this map. Um, and this just gives you a clear understanding of the depth and breadth of our accomplishments and our um, expertise globally. So now to get into our East Coast portfolio. So as you can see, 
and this I'm sure many of you are already aware, but um, we're developing three projects for New York, Empire Win 1, Empire Win 2, those are both in that sort of pizza slice south of Long Island, and Beacon Win 1 um, in Federal Waters uh, of the New York Bight. So Beacon Win and Empire Win are, these projects are in a 50-50 joint venture between Equinor and BP, with Equinor as the operator. And Equinor is really developing these projects to help New York um, meet its ambitious climate goals. The New York State Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which was passed back in 2019, requires the state to reach 70% renewable electricity by 2030 and 100% zero emission electricity by 2040. So this is necessitating a fundamental change in how we're gonna power our homes, our offices, our schools. And by 2035, New York State's goal is to have nine gigawatts of offshore wind, specifically generating renewable power for New Yorkers. And Equinor's offshore wind portfolio is a crucial contributor to New York's shift to electrification. Collectively, Beacon Wind 1, along with Empire Wind 1 and 2, are going to generate 3.3 gigawatts of offshore wind power. So that's enough to electrify over 2 million New York homes, and that's contributing to over one third. So that nine gigawatts, we're already a third um, of that power that we're providing to New York in order for the state to reach its goals. Um, a couple more details. The lease areas were awarded by the federal agency, the U US Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, also known as BOEM, through a competitive renewable lease auction um, of the wind energy area. And an, a, one thing to note on this map is that we have the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal here. So the uh, our operations and maintenance space will be at the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal for these projects, uh, which we're currently transforming to become one of the country's largest offshore wind port facilities, which is super exciting. Uh, and it will also serve as the power interconnection site for Empire Wind One. But um, yeah, it, as this slide sort of shows, we're bringing more than just energy and we're excited to be bringing more than just energy. So through our purchase and sales agreements with uh, NYSERDA, these projects are gonna inject significant economic investments into the state's economy, as you see on the slide here. Um, Equinor and BP are committed to distributing 52 million in social investments across New York to support workforce development, innovation, and communities as part of an overall commitment uh, of 2.5 billion in economic development impact to the state. And uh, I also just want to touch on Equinor's commitment to research and investing in research that uh, will help ensure responsible development of the offshore wind industry to support ocean health, maritime safety, marine mammals, commercial fishing. Um, to date, Equinor is committed to fund $12 million, million dollars, oops, sorry, I went ahead, but I'll just keep going, $12 million to a partnership with the Wildlife Conservation Society and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, through which Equinor is funding real-time monitoring of whales and making that data publicly available. And you can find that data on the WCS website um, and also at the New York Aquarium in Coney Island. And uh, in addition, we're uh, Equinor's committed to $25 million to support regional research projects on key commercial fish stocks and wildlife. And we're developing those agreements with two regional nonprofits to procure and manage those, act those research activities. So that's with the Responsible Offshore Science Alliance, also known as ROSA, and the Regional Wildlife Science Collaborative for Offshore Wind, RWSC. So now that I've given a bit of an overview of our projects, I just wanna to touch on what MedOcean data uh, is exactly. So MedOcean is short for meteorological and oceanographic. Uh, and the photo show here, shown on this slide um, are the Met Ocean buoys getting ready for deployment in for Beacon Wind back in November 2021. They're pretty massive. Um, and the list on the left shows the type of data that's collected by these buoys and moorings. So the meteorological data includes wind speed and wind direction, as well as air term temperature, relative humidity, and barometric pressure. The oceanographic data includes wave heights, periods, and direction, water current uh, speed and direction, water salinity, temperature, and water depth. So this data was collected under each project's site assessment plan, which was approved by BOEM, and allows the buoys and moorings to collect data for two years. 
And so these buoys and moorings were deployed for Empire Wind back in 2018 and removed in 2020. So the data that we're going to see for Empire uh, you'll be that you would be able to access is historical data. And for Beacon Wind, the buoys and moorings were deployed in 2021, and they will are in the water right now and will remain in the water until November 2023. So some of the data we'll see is historical and some of it is in near real time, which is really exciting. So um, and just to conclude, the Empire Wind and Beacon Wind project teams have really relied on this data to inform planning efforts like foundation design, construction schedules, and estimated transit times to and from wind farms uh, during operations. But now uh, I'd like to turn it over to our partners and briefly introduce them so that we can dive deeper into the actual data and, and access. So um, we'll now hear from Mary Ford, Deputy Director of Maracuse, and Kelly Nee, Executive Director of RPS. Mary Ford has significant experience leading engagement in the Mid-Atlantic, and she'll explain what exactly Ocean Maps, Ocean's Maps really is. Um, Kelly is a Water Resources Engineer and Geographic Information Systems, GIS Specialist, with a broad engineering and scientific background, who will walk us through the site and the actual data. Um, so we're super excited to have you both here with us today as incredible technical experts in the room and excited for you to walk us through this. So Kelly and Mary, please take it away. Uh, thank you so much, Grace, and thank you all for the opportunity to walk through America's Oceans Map. We're really excited to introduce you to the tool and um, show how our partners like Equinor contribute to this dynamic data ecosystem. But before we walk through Ocean's Map, I'm gonna talk very, very briefly about IUS and Maracuse, just to give you a, a bit of background. Next slide, please. So the US Integrated Ocean Observing System, or IUS, is a national regional partnership that works to provide new tools and forecasts that improve safety, enhance the economy, and protect our environment. It's made up of 11 regional associations that are dispersed nationally and includes um, 17 federal partner agencies. Through IUS and our partners, the integrated ocean information is available in near real time as well as retrospectively. And this easier and better access to integrated data improves the ability to understand and predict coastal events, such as storms, wave heights, flooding, and, and much many, many more things. This access to data is really just one of the things that ICE contributes to the new blue economy. Next slide, please. So Maracus is, um, the IUS Mid-Atlantic Regional Association, and we focus on the areas between Cape Cod and Cape Hatteras. Our region includes over 78 million people who work, live, play, do all the things in the coasts, bays, and estuaries within that region. Maracuse is an independent 501c3, and it's critical. We're made up of partners and stakeholders from federal, state, local governments, nonprofit associations, academic institutions, and private, se private sector companies. And while we'll be showcasing our flagship data visualization tool, Ocean's Map, Maricus and our partners are doing critical data collection and stakeholder engagement in many, many areas throughout the region. Um, collecting these distinctive data and community insights really helps improve the tools and products used for decision-making. And one key piece in what Maracuse does is focus on that iterative stakeholder engagement process, which connects the data collectors, stakeholders, and tool developers, and ensures that unique regional needs are being met and data types and tools are updated as requirements change. We take a lot of pride in our relationships and partnerships and could not fill regional needs without collaborations with partners like RPS and Equinor, for example. The Equinor data, which Kelly will showcase later, helps fill a gap and is available to contribute to regional and national products. This is a prime example of how public and private sector partnerships 
increase equitable access to reliable, consistent, and accurate data. This access goes further and contributes to improving the resilience of coastal communities and economies. Next slide, please. I mentioned our partners and stakeholders collect data and engage in many areas. So I did just want to very briefly highlight the five Maracruz focus areas, which include maritime commerce and safety, fisheries and natural resources, coastal hazards, water quality, and energy. And these focus areas help Maracruz prioritize and um, make decisions on, on things that we want to do. So next slide, please. In addition to collecting and integrating diverse data, we take data quality very seriously and are proud to be an officially certified regional association. What this means in short is that our data is as good as or better than data you would get from federal partners. Um, this certification process is very transparent and provides additional confidence in these regional products that we and our partners are able to provide. Um, this allows for more access to data and more efficiency in interagency and partner coordination at the regional and national level. And there's a QR code on this slide and you can find a lot more information about certification from there. Um, now that I've set the stage, we get to transition to the fun stuff. So Kelly Nee from RPS will delve into Maracruz Oceans Map Portal, which is very fun. Um, the RPS Ocean Science Team is a critical partner and has been supporting Maracruz and IUS with data management, cyber infrastructure for almost 20 years. They also play a key role in providing environmental data to the US Coast Guard to support search and rescue. Um, RPS developed the Oceans Map Platform to bring together disparate data sets into a common operational picture and decision support system. It is important to note that the wider RPS team has been involved in developing 35 gigawatts of offshore wind in the UK since the early stages of the industry and are supporting developers in over 20 US wind energy lease and call areas. So, uh, with that, I'm excited to pass it off to Kelly and give you all a demo of Ocean's Map. Okay, thank you very much, Mary, for the great introduction and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Mary mentioned, we're really excited about the opportunity to integrate the Equinor Med Ocean data into the Maracu system. Um, the platform that the MedOcean data has been integrated into is called Oceans Map, and it's been developed over a number of years with key partners that include Maracuse, IUS, the NOAA Center for Operational Prediction, the U.S. Coast Guard, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And Ocean Map integrates a broad range. Oh, sorry, can you switch slides, Grace? Um, Oceans Map integrates a broad range of both centralized and third-party data services from both operational and experimental sources, and it provides a platform for collaboration and decision-making across a whole range of industries and stakeholders. Uh, while we've been working with Maracuse for more than 15 years now, over the last several years, our partnership has really been focused on working closely with, um, with them and specifically integrating Oceans Map and the data services that feed into it into workflows for specific stakeholders, specific groups of stakeholders. That includes off the offshore wind industry, the navigation community, and the coastal management community. Next slide, please. So what is Oceans Map? Um, I really love to compare Oceans Map to an iceberg. What the user sees when you go through the web interface is really a very small piece of what's going on in the entire system, which is comprised of data harvesters, processors, data services that are bringing together MedOcean data and forecasts from a whole range of disparate sources into a single platform that's predicated on data standards. Uh, it really is an ecosystem because it changes and involves with changing measurement technology, compute innovations, and stakeholder needs. 
Uh, RPS is leading an effort right now that includes stakeholders from across the IUS community and how to transition data management to using cloud native approaches. And so that potentially huge behind the scenes transition uh, in the back end of OceanSnap will be completely seamless to users, right? They might see some benefits or improvements in performance or visualization, but we can totally change the back end and have a consistent uh, user experience through the front end. So all that to say that there's a lot going on under the surface of Ocean's Map. Next slide, please. There's also a lot going on below the surface of the ocean when it comes to data collection, right? And this slide really speaks to the diversity of data being collected to support permitting, construction, and operations of major offshore energy developments across the globe. Um, the diversity of data, the number of people out there collecting it is really incredible. Um, and when you look at all these elements together onto the same page, um, you can really understand just how much goes into understanding the offshore conditions and providing the information that stakeholders need for working offshore. So you can see literally dozens, if not hundreds of data sets in play here, often being collected by different entities, not being managed centrally. And so Ocean's Map really has a role as acting in acting as the integrator for all these data streams. It brings them together into a single platform. It allows visual overlays. It allows exploration of how conditions change over time and, and data analysis. Next slide, please. And Maracus, uh, specifically and I use generally are really leaders in this space. They're leaders when it comes to open data sharing, data democratization. Um, they really understand the importance of making a broad range of ocean data available for wider use. And so when Equinor sort of came to Maracuse about integrating their data into the system, everybody was super excited. Um, Maracuse really does play a key role in enabling these successful national, regional, private, public partnerships that support production, integration, and commun communication of high quality ocean information via a series of data centers. Um, and it all follows IU's data management protocols, right? Those protocols are what enable us to bring all this data together efficiently and effectively. So I, I used to establish these data standards and requirements literally years ago now, and a whole community of stakeholders has coalesced around them. And as a community, we've adopted formats, metadata, data standards, controlled vocabularies, data access services that are now becoming more and more widely used. And we have a growing community of data providers like Equinor that now know how to plug into the system and understand the value and importance of things like good metadata and data standards so that the data being collected can be understood and reused, which ultimately adds a lot more value to that data. Um, and there's also now a whole community of data wranglers, I'll call them, that are available to assist with implementation of IU's protocols and a whole new and growing community of data users that are increasingly reliant in using on the data streams that are made available through Maracuse and through ICE. Next slide, please. And so without any further ado, I'm gonna jump into some demonstrations. Uh, no live demo uh, would be complete without a little bit of risk. Uh, and so I do wanna just quickly note that I've been having some connection issues this morning. Uh, so I do have a colleague of mine, Sherry Schwartz on the line, and she will back me up if anything goes wrong with my internet connection. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead now and share my own screen. All right, Grace, can I get a thumbs up if you see that? Yep. All right. Um, and so this is the Maracuse Oceans Map platform. Uh, so if you go to oceansmapmaracuse.org, don't all do that now, pay attention, uh, pay attention to the webinar. Um, this is what you'll see, this is the default view. So um, what you see now are some uh, sea surface temperatures, uh, satellite sea surface temperatures, and some, some gliders down here at the bottom of the screen. Um, and as I said, this is the default view. Actually, if I close this tab, this is the default view. Um, and what you see along the left side here are a number of icons that indicate all the tools available from uh, the Maracuse Oceans Map platform. 
So first and foremost, we have our data catalog, which shows all of the data layers available in the platform. They are categorized by data types. So there are a number of different categories that you can expand here. Um, we have the ability to add virtual stations so that you can create time series plot and other types of plots uh, from model forecast data. I'll go through some of these tools in, in more detail in a few moments, but um, the ability to create a, a multivariate analysis of uh, multiple data sets at the same time, which we call our traffic light tool. Uh, the ability to validate models and observations uh, using observations on the fly, which is a really cool functionality. Uh, you can add custom layers. You have a lot of control over your base map if you want to change what the base map looks like. Uh, we have a compare tool, which is similar to the sort of swipe map. Those of you that are GIS users might be familiar with using in an Esri system. Um, and then a number of different stories that we tell with the data, which are sort of pre-defined um, for users to go in and explore. And then, of course, we love to get feedback. So if you have feedback on our system, um, please don't hesitate to enter it there. And then in the upper right-hand corner here, we have um, some tools more for sort of interacting um, with the, the map, uh, so sharing your map view with another uh, colleague or user. Once you've built up a beautiful map that you love, you can create a, a permanent link to that map and then share it around. Uh, you can create nice screenshots for dropping into presentations. You can create animations. Um, you have the ability to activate tooltips. So as you hover over data sets, you are seeing um, all of the different data values as you move around the map, you can measure distances, um, and then also view a legend of your grid. And then at the bottom of the screen is what we call the time slider. This is arguably the most important part of Ocean's Map. All of the data in Ocean's Map is synced in time. So you, I loaded up this, um, this browser tab uh, just before we started the webinar. So everything is synced to about 11 o'clock Eastern time uh, here. And um, every data set coming into the system, unless it's a sort of static GIS layer, has um, timestamps. And so as observations or forecasts are updated over time that new data streams in um, and it's all synced in time. And you can also go back and look at historical data, which we will do uh, for the empire in this area. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and just show some of the Equinor data. Uh, so we'll turn off our defaults here. I'll go ahead and turn on the beacon insights and empire sites. And so um, as Grace explained, um, the Empire data is historical, so you have to go back in time in Ocean's Map to look at that. And the Beacon data is a mix of live data and some historical data. Um, so if I go ahead and click on that Beacon LiDAR buoy, um, it's going to show me the values um, from right now, essentially. Uh, so you can go ahead and look at the parameters that that buoy is collecting and create time series from them. Draw some plots. Um, if you mouse over the plots, you can see the actual values uh, over time. You do have the ability to change colors. So you can um, change that color palette to whatever you would like to see. Um, and from there, you can start adding additional contextual data, right? So you have a whole catalog of data sets at your fingertips in Ocean's Map. So I can go ahead and add a little bit of GIS data, right? So I'll add some historical um, AIS data. So these are vessel transit counts. Um, this, this is not live AIS data. This is an annual aggregate of traffic. And you could add the wind energy lease areas to provide yourself some additional geographic context, right? Um, so you can start really building up these stories with the Oceans Map that really speak to what it is that you need to do with the system. Um, in this case, we will go ahead and add some forecast data, right? So we're uh, looking at a wind LiDAR buoy. Let's go ahead and add a wind forecast. So we'll add a global GFS forecast. Let's go ahead and load up. So you can see those wind barbs coming in. And you can go ahead and add that to your time series plot, right? And so I'll turn the wave height here. So now we're just looking at winds. Um, and so now we're looking at a time series of measured winds in the dark purple. Actually, let me change that color for you so it's a little bit easier to see. So we're looking at measured winds in the magenta and the brown time series is the forecast winds from the global forecast. And so now we're doing a heads up comparison of observations to model forecasts. 
Um, and you can actually take this comparison one step further by clicking on this little validate button. And so what's that, what that's going to do is it's going to open up the validate tool that I quickly showed earlier, um, but it's already pre-configured with the data that I have loaded on the map, right? And so it knows that I want to validate wind speed data using that beacon LiDAR buoy and using the global GIS forecast that I loaded up. So I click calculate. All this happens on the fly. And now I've got some nice air statistics. So it's a comparison um, of the observations to the, the global forecast. And you have the ability to compare to any forecast that's included in, in Ocean's Map. So you could go ahead and choose something else um, and start to see, well, what model is performing the best in the moment? Or what model performs the best under specific types of, of conditions that are happening? So in the interest of time, I, I won't show a lot of um, different examples of that, but it's a very, very powerful tool for trying to understand um, how well your model forecast is performing against some actual observations. Um, and as Mary mentioned, the Equinor data fills a really nice gap offshore, right? Provides some additional observations for being able to do that validation against forecasts. Um, and I should also note that GFS data, the, that forecast is a three-dimensional forecast. So we have a whole profile of the forecast data up to 100 meters. Um, and the last thing I want to show in this example is the permalink tool. So this is the tool for sharing your map with your colleagues or your, or your friends. Um, so if you click on that tool, it gives you a whole series of options for customizing that permalink. Do you want to persist the base map that you've set up? Do you want to persist the zoom level, the map view that you've set up? Um, which data layers do you want it to include, right? So you, you read through all those settings. Um, the defaults are usually pretty good though. And then you click create URL. And what that does is create a shareable URL. You go ahead and copy that, put it in an email, shoot it to your friend and teams. Um, and that permalink is now saved permanently. You can bookmark it, um, whatever you wanna do. And so that you don't have to start from the default view in Notion Stump. You can always start from the view that you want to use. Um, because Americas Oceans Map is a publicly available site, we don't have a login, so we don't have a way to save it, that, um, save folks' independent views that way. So we use this permalink solution. Um, and all of these insights that I showed quickly over here, um, these are all just permalinks that we've added nice titles and descriptions to. Okay, so the next quick example I want to show is the historical data. Um, and so, as I mentioned when we started, um, the time slider controls what you see on the map, what you see in your plots. And so in this case, I have already set my time slider using these time slider controls, which you access through this little calendar icon back to 2020, because that is when the Empire um, instrumentation was out in the water. And so in this case, we're looking at the Empire Wind Met buoy, but we're looking at historical data. We're looking at June 2020. And so this is a time series plot of the wind speeds and the wave heights that were measured at that time period. And so to the extent that that's good for you, for you, you want to go back in time, it's very easy to do that. Um, and you can tell um, data availability in time by just hovering over um, one of your stations and you can see that validate there, right? So the last valid time of the Empire when Met buoy was November 27, 2020. And that lets you figure out you know, what, how to set your time slider. And so the next example I wanted to show is one of these um, uh, traffic light um, examples. And so this is a multivariate analysis um, of wind data, wind forecasts, uh, and wave forecasts together. And I'll just open up the tool so we can show how I set it up here. Um, and so in this case, um, imagine that you were planning a, a, blade, a turbine blade inspection, right? And so you need to put uh, folks on a vessel. You need to take them offshore. You need to transfer them to the turbine so that they can do their inspection. And so all of that depends on favorable weather conditions, right? And so you probably have certain criteria that, that you would want to do that under relative to waves, relative to winds, whatever it might be. And so in this case, um, we have set it up so that um, we're looking for wave heights that are less than about a meter and a quarter and wind speeds that are less than about eight meters per second in order to do that, that work, right? 
right? And so we're analyzing a wave forecast, the Atlantic GFS wave forecast and the global GFS wind forecast against those criteria. Those are user entered criteria um, and creating both a map and a time series of when um, those conditions are met or exceeded. And so what you see in green is where those conditions are met. What you see in amber is that sort of uh, intermediate period. You can sort of set that um, uh, low criteria here, the high criteria, and then uh, that in between will just show as amber. So that, that's a condition where you might, might want to think a little bit about the safety of going offshore. And then red is where all the criteria are exceeded. You don't, you don't want to be working offshore. And so what you see on the map is how that uh, looks for a single time for all space, right? So we're looking at a single time step for the entire geographic area that those models cover on the map. But what you see in the time series plot is um, a single location. So this is the location I clicked on right here that's blinking um, over time. So that you can see that yesterday when I set this up, the conditions were unfavor unfavorable in that location. They're improving. We're still sort of in this amber caution um, phase, but that starting um, later today, this evening and into the weekend, the conditions look like they'll be favorable for doing that kind of work offshore. And so you can really start to use this as a planning tool for whatever it is that you might want to be doing offshore. So the next example I want to show um, is admittedly a little bit of eye candy. We have a fun globe view in Oceans Map, which you can enable through this uh, base maps tab. So you can see I have globe view clicked on there. Um, and this is sea surface temperature data. This is global Navy HICOM sea surface temperature data, which looks pretty beautiful when displayed on this globe. And um, just wanted to start, you know, talking a little bit about hurricane season, right? So obviously sea surface temperature um, really uh, plays into how active a hurricane series, uh, season is. Um, and so something that a lot of folks are keeping a close, close eye on. Um, you can see the, the Gulf Stream, that warmer water heading north right here. Um, so this is a pretty cool way to look at data. And then you can start to, um, to turn this off. You can also look at anomaly data in Ocean's map. So I'll turn off the global high -com. We have this cool, uh, this is, uh, goes SST anomaly. So this is a satellite data set. And what this is looking at is um, how different the sea surface temperature is from a normal year, right? And so if you see it in red, it means the sea surface temperature is hotter than a normal year, warmer than a normal year. And in blue, those are the areas where the sea surface temperature is cooler than a normal year. And so that's, um, this is data, you know, just from a couple of days ago. Um, so it's a pretty cool view of how things are playing out in terms of sea surface temperature. It is a regional data set, which is why you don't see it covering the whole grid. And then um, if you want to dig in a little bit more into how you might use Ocean's Map to get an idea of what's going on in a hurricane, um, you can start to add different forecast data, different observation data to your map. And so um, I pulled in some data from Hurricane Brett, which happened down in the Caribbean last week. And so what you're looking at here is a wave height forecast. Um, so this is the Atlantic GFS wave height forecast um, and the global GFS wind forecast. And you can see Hurricane Brett right here. And I clicked right in the middle of it. There's no observation station there, right? So I haven't clicked on an observation station like I did with Beacon Wind or Empire Wind earlier. Um, I just clicked right on that forecast data and it's created what we call a virtual station. And so it's brought back a time series of those forecasts. And so you can see how in that location, the wind speed and the wave height have ramped up um, as a hurricane passed over that location and then ramped back down. Um, and again, um, we have that profile of the wind speed data because GFS is a, a three-dimensional data set. Um, as you have observations or other information available, um, for a particular hurricane, you might have gliders that are in the picture. In some cases, you can start to show all that data to bring it all together and create, again, that share link that's maybe specific to a, a particular hurricane event. Um, and then, so the next example is the comparison tool. So in this case, that's this tool right here. Um, I've set it up so that we're looking at a regional current forecast, the Maracuse Dopio forecast on the left-hand side, 
and a global um, current forecast or hydrodynamic forecast on the right hand side. And so what we're doing here is just comparing those two forecasts with this with this cool swipe tool. And so you can see in this case the differences in the Gulf Stream forecast between that regional hydrodynamic model and that global hydrodynamic model. And you can use any data set that you want. Um, it's very easy to turn them on in your table of contents, choose the data sets that you're interested in, and then in this compare mode tool, you just click, um, you choose which side of the map you want those data sets on, and, and off you go. So a lot of fun to play with this tool. And then the very last thing that I wanted to show uh, is relatively new to Ocean's Map. This is our dashboard view. And you know we understand that not every user needs a map of a region or the globe. Sometimes you're very focused on a very specific location, right? So in this case, um, we've pulled together all of the information that we have about the, uh, or from the Beacon Wind LIDAR, right? And so some, a table of life conditions, um, some time series plots of the winds and the waves, um, this is actually a validation tool. So in this case, we're um, comparing a forecast um, of wave heights with the observations of wave heights. You can pull in some more advanced plots than you can from the map view. So we have a polar distribution plot of the wave height and direction here. And then you can also pull in a version of that traffic light tool, right? So we pulled in a time series plot here um, showing where the winds and the waves are exceeding the, the thresholds that we're interested in for that particular location. So that's about it. That was my last demo. Um, so I will turn things back over to you, Grace. Thank you so much, Kelly, for walking us through Ocean's Map. That was super interesting and, and exciting to see how comprehensive uh, the tool is, how much data is out there um, and those live conditions as well. So thank you so much for walking us through that. And thank you, uh, Mary, as well. So now I as we're sort of approaching the last 15 minutes, uh, I'd like to open up the floor to any questions. So if you have a question, um, please put it in the Q&A uh, function um, and I will sort of filter through them and read them out. Um, but yeah, I would just like to add that, you know, Equinor is very proud to be contributing to this open da data sharing and you know, we're committed to continuing to prioritize transparency and knowledge sharing as we're developing our Empire and Beacon projects. But um, I'll just give a moment to let any questions filter in. And Grace, if you don't mind, while people are thinking of questions, I do just want to mention um, Ocean's Map is really fun. It, and if you don't think of questions now, <laughs> I think of questions and I work with Ocean's Map every single day. I I think of questions all the time or like find new ways to use it. So if you don't think of questions now, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or Kelly and we'll make sure everybody has the information there. And um we will have we'll be happy to answer questions or or, or find new ways to play with Ocean's Map. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, and I'll also put my own email here in the chat um, in case folks want to get in touch or in case you think of any questions related to the projects. Um, I don't see, oh, we have one question. Oh, so this is a question actually from someone on our team, but um, curious to know how we would pull relevant information um, to share as part of our community engagement efforts. So, um, I mean, as I mentioned, the I know that our Beacon Wind team and Empire Wind team has already relied on uh, this data to inform a lot of project development. And Kelly, as you mentioned, I know that um, uh, a crucial part of this is just seeing safe conditions, right? So determining when it's safe to go out to see, um, to maintain those turbines. Um, and I feel like, you know, that is a huge, safety is a huge, huge um, uh, value at Equinor and emphasizing that to the community 
and the fact that we're using science and data to drive our um, safe our operations and ensuring that they're safe uh, is crucial. Um, but Kelly, I don't know if anything else comes to mind there, but I think um, also just having this data available for folks, whether it's researchers, students, um, you know, boaters, fisher, fishermen, and fisheries rather, um, it's uh, it's something that they can use right now um, to determine their their um, you know their patterns, and I think that's also pretty pretty important. But um, yeah. I can add a little just in terms of the mechanics of sh of sharing data or pulling relevant data. So you can obviously um, you can show all these examples. There's too much to really demo in a short webinar, but there's a there's a screenshot tool that will make you a really nice image for a presentation or a report. Uh, there's an animation tool, so you can create a really nice smooth animation of how data changes over time using that tool. Um, the permalink is tool tool is great for sharing a live web map that you you want folks to be able to reuse. But we completely understand that no interface is going to be able to allow folks to access and play with the data in every way that that folks will want to, right? And so all of the data is publicly available and downloadable. So it's all stored on either Threads or ERDAP at this point. Um, as I mentioned, we're looking at uh, cloud native approaches, but that's where it is now. Um, and so you can access that data, you can subset it and you can pull it down yourself um, and then you can do whatever you need to do with it. So there's lots of different ways, um, depending on the needs of the community engagement efforts or actually see another question um, in the Q&A about whether you can export the raw data database. So the answer to that question is yes, we can. Thank you, Kelly. Again, want to thank our partners um, for being here today and for taking us through Ocean's Map. Um, and like I said, Equinor is very proud to be contributing to this data. Um, and yeah, just want to say thank you to everybody for joining. Um, and as a reminder, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to the team. I put my email here in the chat. Um, and otherwise, I hope everyone has a great rest of the day, great rest of the afternoon, um, and thank you.